how effective is red light therapy, also known as low-level laser therapy for hair loss? And is it worth the spend? My name is Blake Brooks. I'm a board-certified dermatologist and hair specialist. And on this channel, I talk about all things hair with some things skin and beauty too. If that sounds like something you're interested in, please like this video, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any new content. I put videos out on a regular basis, so if there's something you wanna learn about, just let me know. Today, we're going to dive into red light caps, or low-level laser therapy for hair loss, and if it's worth the spend. I'm further going to discuss if it's adding benefit in patients who are using topical Rogaine or Minoxidil, which is often one of the first treatments employed by my patients. At the end, I'm going to talk about available devices, who's a good versus bad candidate for treatment and side effects, so make sure you stay tuned. A lot of my patients who come into my clinic are interested in learning about alternative treatments for hair loss. Hair loss is really, really tough, and it's not a great feeling to be told the only effective treatment is something that makes you uncomfortable. And a lot of prescribed medications for certain patients, because of that, are just not the right fit. I'm a really strong believer in meeting the patient where they're at, meaning you have to listen to what someone feels is right for them or nothing will be effective. If you sit and push an oral medication on someone, but they just aren't comfortable, they're probably not going to take it and they're going to feel like they're alone and without a partner to help them find a treatment regimen that works. Things like low-level laser therapy are really interesting for certain patients. It kind of fits in that category for me of something that has evidence behind it but doesn't carry some of the concerns that prescribed medications may. And sometimes people prefer it even to topical medications because it's often considered easier by some than applying topical medications to their scalp. Remember, topical medications have to be applied twice daily. I often talk to my patients about the importance of knowing what will be palatable or tolerable to them. But if you're someone who generally doesn't like applying lotions and creams or more time intensive regimens, it really just might be the wrong fit for you. You have to find treatments that are effective for you based on your preferences and lifestyle and evidence. Before I delve into low-level laser therapy, how it works, and some of the evidence behind it, let's first briefly talk about pattern hair loss in men and women and what's happening so we can in some ways understand the benefits of these treatments. In both male and female pattern hair loss, there is a process called miniaturization where the hairs that are affected start to get finer and finer, meaning their diameter gets smaller and smaller. Normal hairs go through a growth cycle where they remain in the actively growing part of the hair cycle or the anagen phase for many years. The number of years can vary from person to person for a number of factors. In pattern hair loss, the anagen or actively growing phase gets shorter and shorter with finer and finer hairs until the hair is lost. In male pattern hair loss, we can point to a particular hormone called DHT as underlying these changes. We understand the hormonal underpinnings of female pattern hair loss much less well but the changes the vulnerable hairs undergo are similar. A lot of our treatments for pattern hair loss work by blocking hormonal pathways or by other mechanisms, which honestly we don't fully understand, but many of them are reliant upon activation of the hair follicles through purported mechanisms and lengthening of the antigen or actively growing phase, essentially reversing the shortening of the growth phase I talked about earlier. And when we evaluate how well some of our treatments work, we look at a number of different things and hair diameter or thickness is one of them because it shows us that some of the changes that we see in pattern hair loss are reversing. Let's get into low level laser therapy, also known as photobiomodulation. It refers to those red light caps or combs that you may have seen on social media or advertisements. Low level laser therapy works by delivering red or near infrared light to the hair follicles with then a hypothesized mechanism involving ultimately improving cell metabolism, energy production, and growth factor production in an important part of the hair follicle, leading to hair regrowth and lengthening of that growth phase of the hair cycle. But does it work? The data is pretty compelling. There are numerous studies suggesting its benefit. The studies vary in terms of how they were conducted. Importantly though, studies included men and women with pattern hair loss, extending the applicability to both genders. Unfortunately, they did not include darker skin types or those skin types that are sometimes classified as Fitzpatrick 5 and 6, and so the data isn't there for all patients. The studies looked at various parameters in terms of evaluating outcomes, hair density and diameter, hair count, coverage and thickness, and not all of them looked at all of those and not all showed significant improvement in all parameters, but most of the studies saw improvement around 16 to 26 weeks. 
That's the time point, which is an appropriate time point to evaluate hair regrowth. As we usually tell patients, we need about four to six months to see improvement, maybe three months at the very earliest from any initiated hair treatment. I'm talking about these time points for a reason, which is to say when you look at studies in the literature evaluating the benefits of various interventions for hair, look at that time frame. It's important. With that in mind, I want to draw attention to an article that was recently published that kind of called into question the benefit of low-level laser treatment for certain people. It's so, so, so important to closely evaluate studies. This one came into my feed as breaking news in hair research. I took a deep dive into the article and came away from it realizing I wouldn't change anything in terms of patient counseling based on the outcomes because I really didn't believe that they provided any relevant data. The article looked at the efficacy of topical minoxidil or Rogaine alone versus minoxidil in combination with low-level laser therapy. The conclusion of the article was basically that if someone is using topical Rogaine twice daily, they will derive no additional benefit from low-level laser therapy. It's really not uncommon that someone is using Rogaine, doesn't want to take an oral medication, but wants to add an additional treatment like low-level laser therapy, so this was a big upset to me. To backtrack, minoxidil, also known as Rogaine, is one of our most well-studied and used medications in hair loss for men and women. It works in part by extending that actively growing part of the hair cycle. So there is some overlap in terms of the purported mechanism to low-level laser therapy. While both minoxidil and low-level laser therapy work in part through the extension of that growth phase of the hair cycle, they are thought to accomplish it in different ways. So in theory, they complement one another when used together. This systematic review and meta-analysis looked at four separate studies that met their inclusion criteria, ultimately including 188 male and female patients, so a good number. They looked at not only hair counts, but also hair diameter. And that's important because remember, in pattern hair loss, hair is miniaturized, affecting hair diameter. So one of the things we hope will happen with our treatments is rejuvenation of those hairs which would ultimately lead to increased diameter through the reversal of the miniaturization process. The big problem with this study is that they included follow-up periods of eight to 12 weeks for the four studies included, meaning they only evaluated changes in hair eight to 12 weeks after initiation of treatment. Remember when I said that we don't expect to see clinical improvement in hair for four to six months at the very earliest three months after a new treatment has started? So this data is very strange to me, especially when we consider that in studies that showed improvement with low-level laser therapy at 24 weeks, earlier time points didn't always demonstrate significant improvement. What's stranger is that when you look at the individual studies that were included, the time points become more relevant. The first study included looked at female patients only applying 2% minoxidil twice daily. I take issue with this, and I'll touch on that in a moment versus combination therapy, so combination of 2% minoxidil with low-level laser therapy. They did look at 12 weeks, but this study also looked at 24 weeks, and that's when the combination therapy actually did better. That time point wasn't included in the systematic review because they said there was variability in time points in all studies, so couldn't include this. The second study included looked at male and female patients applying 5% minoxidil twice daily, like that much better than 2% minoxidil, versus combination therapy, again with low-level laser therapy. This study looked at several time points, including 12 weeks, 24 weeks, 36 weeks, 52 weeks. And here's the kicker. In this study, there was no difference between groups at 12 weeks, the only time point included in the systematic review, but there were significant differences seen at all other time points, none of which were included in the systematic review. The third study looked at female patients only applying 5% minoxidil twice daily versus combination therapy. This study looked at eight weeks and 16 week time points with only the eight week time point included in the systematic review. The study noted that at 16 weeks, improvements were greater with significant improvement in the combination group. It is interesting that in this study, they were able to notice a difference at eight weeks with one parameter, which is really surprising, but going to be balanced here. And there's that. The fourth study looked at 12 and 24 week time points. There was no difference seen at either time point. So that's kind of a moot point. Overall, I'm very underwhelmed with this paper. I feel like this systematic review is really giving a strange report of the data because it doesn't include time points where in several studies you actually saw the difference between the treatments. And again, this does make sense to me because you need time to see improvements in hair whenever you start a new treatment. I often tell my patients, seeing hair growth is kind of like watching water boil. 
Also, I want to quickly round back to the fact that the first study included in their view used 2% minoxidil. While 2% minoxidil has been, and in some places still is, marketed to women, we know in the hair world that women benefit from 5% minoxidil. So that's kind of strange, in my opinion, as it's not testing the treatments we generally use in the real world. I generally talk to my female patients about how minoxidil is a great example of the pink tax, where women pay more for the same product or lesser product based on marketing tactics. There actually was a study on this and it showed that women pay on average 40% more for minoxidil than men. I always tell my female patients buy the 5% minoxidil, don't pay more for the 2% minoxidil, which will do less for you and always buy the men's formulation, it's cheaper. So I don't love that we have a study looking at 2% minoxidil because it's really not reflective of how most hair specialists prescribe and recommend medications. So coming back to low-level laser therapy, do I think it's worth it? I think there's data to suggest it is, and I don't think that the recent systematic review is enough to suggest that using low-level laser therapy in addition to Rogaine is without benefit. In fact, the individual studies might suggest it is, and the evidence is enough that when the European Dermatology Forum developed guidelines for evidence-based management of pattern hair loss, they concluded that guidelines suggest using low-level laser therapy as an ancillary therapy for pattern hair loss with devices using energy levels shown effective in randomized controlled trials. While I do think there's data to suggest its utility and efficacy, I want to keep in mind an important point, which is that while there are numerous studies suggesting its benefit for hair regrowth and pattern hair loss, it's not been standardized. So there's a lack of clarity surrounding light source, light versus laser versus combination, Optimal diode density, meaning how far apart the lights are, wavelength and treatment duration and frequency. So we really don't know which device parameters work best. And we might not have devices on the market yet that work optimally for hair regrowth. What do I mean by that? Well, it's kind of interesting. When we think about lasers, we have to remember that lasers work by targeting something specific called a chromophore, which they do by emitting a specific wavelength. It should be noted that LEDs, which is the other light source sometimes included in low-level laser therapy devices, do this less effectively in that they emit light that is less focused or broader band light, but there are reasons for their inclusion in products like cost, increased coverage, and some studies have actually shown non-dependence of photobiomodulation or activation of the hair follicles on lasers. For low-level laser therapy, the chromophore we are thought to be targeting is something called cytochrome C oxidase in the mitochondria. Currently available laser devices use wavelengths ranging from about 635 nanometers to 675 nanometers. But interestingly, there are other animal studies that have suggested that wavelengths different from those currently represented in marketed devices would be more appropriate for optimal hair growth. It's unlikely that a bunch of other devices with new wavelengths will flood the market because of something called FDA 510K clearance meaning these laser caps and combs and devices are considered low-risk medical devices by the FDA. And in the U.S., a company can take a low-risk medical device product to market faster and cheaper by obtaining 510 clearance, which basically means that the device coming to the market is equivalent in safety to a previously approved device. If a new wavelength were employed, a much costlier process would need to be undertaken to get clearance. Additionally, we have to remember that for safety reasons to protect consumers' eyes, Low-level laser therapy device's strength, it's quite low. In fact, a laser with 100 times the power of over-the-counter devices could biostimulate, meaning activate the hair follicles, without heating the tissue, but wouldn't be allowed because of danger to eyes. That isn't to say we aren't seeing improvements in studies with these devices, but it is to say that improvement may be less than could be seen with a different wavelength or with more power than can be included in over-the-counter devices. Also, it should be noted that there are those that question how well the studies were conducted that evaluated the efficacy of these devices. That's because it's really hard to objectively look at hair parameters, and the gold standard called a phototrichogram is not seen in many of the studies. With all of that said, I think in certain patient populations, this is a really good option, and that data, while imperfect, does suggest benefit. There are some people who probably are poor candidates because they're less likely to respond or because there isn't data that can suggest improvement for particular populations. For people with dark hair and minimal hair loss, there might be less benefit because the light may be impeded. And for people with severe hair loss, there may be less benefit as well as low-level laser therapy needs some viable follicles to work. 
So patients with dark hair and minimal hair loss or severe hair loss may be less likely to respond, and these devices are costly, so it's an important factor to consider. It should be also noted that low-level laser therapy hair combs might in part help with some of the interference from thick hair, so you could try that. Also, studies didn't include patients with darker skin types, so we don't have data on whether or not these devices are effective in these populations. It's been concluded in some studies that patients with intermediate hair loss respond best for this reason. I often get asked about side effects, and when considering side effects, the side effects profile is excellent. There have been rare reports of telogen effluvium or temporary hair shedding developing in the first one to two months of treatment, specifically with the laser comb, but that subsided after continued therapy. Otherwise, it's possible that cancers or precancerous spots on the scalp might be stimulated to grow by proliferative effects. So if you have an actively growing cancer or a spot that's being monitored on the scalp, it could be a poor choice. If you want to move towards low-level laser therapy, there are a number of home devices, and these devices range substantially in terms of light source, so that LED versus laser versus combination, number of diodes or lights, power, wavelength, treatment regimen, which ranges from 90 seconds to upwards of 30 minutes, and cost. Head-to-head -head studies, unfortunately, aren't really available, making it hard to say one is definitively superior but I'm going to put some links in the description of companies with low-level laser therapy devices that have data behind them. And it should be noted that all of these companies tested devices in men and women, and in a recent systematic review that looked at all low-level laser therapy home devices with clinical trial data, there were no differences seen between men and women in terms of outcomes, which is great. You should also make sure you check because some of the devices, while expensive, are HSA or FSA eligible, which can make them much more affordable. Have you guys used these devices? Which brands have you used? Which ones do you like? Have you seen results? Let me know in the comments.